How do you run an enemy party in combat against your players using player character classes to attack your player characters? How do you do that? Hey everybody, it's Nick, and for those of you who don't know or are new to the channel, I typically make campaign diaries sort of discussing what happened in my campaign this previous week, uh, successes that I had, mistakes that I made, lessons that I learned, things that you can rip off and steal from my game and use in your own, or never use in your own because they were terrible ideas. And so uh, I am absolutely going to sort of recap the story of what happened in my uh, session this past week, but if you don't care about that and you care about how did I make an enemy party that I'd used against my player characters without just building like six or seven uh, PC classes at sixth level or seventh level and something crazy like that that would take so much time. How did I do that? Uh, I will leave a timestamp down below or something like that where you can just uh, jump ahead to that design if that's all you care about. All right, so now that that's out of the way, let's talk about what happened in my campaign this week. Get up to that point where we talk about the enemy party. When last we left our heroes... So our group of adventurers had snatched defeat from the jaws of victory as they went through this dungeon and found it had already been cleaned out by a growing rival in the Titan Guard Adventuring Guild, who are natives of Krell, the nation that they are invading. And so the players returned home sort of downcast, and when they got back to their city of operations, Bolero, they found there was a special meeting of all the other special forces teams. Teams, and the other teams were talking about what had been going on recently, the adventures and, and stuff that they had been doing, and the raptors, the uh, annoying bullies that the players have been dealing with, were talking about what they were doing, what they were up to, and they had been infiltrating the nation of Krell and stealing a scientist from them, basically. The person who whose grandfather invented black powder and would be able to synthesize it for them and help them create and utilize gunpowder through their campaign. So they successfully captured him. However, in the process, they lost somebody. There, there was a, an individual of their team was captured. They tried to uh, recapture them at a later mission, but it turned out it was a trap and their person wasn't there. They barely escaped with their lives. And so they said, well, what are you going to do? Well, as it turns out, the person who was captured was somebody the players like kind of a lot, was the only individual in that team who had been any degree of nice to them. Uh, someone codenamed Falcon, they all go by call signs and code names in that group, and so uh, this individual's name was Falcon, was an elf, and they decided, you know what? We're going to stick it to our bullies, and we are going to go try to rescue Falcon. And, you know, the other people were like, no, what are you going to do? Okay, come on, sure, really, we failed and you're going to succeed? Okay, I mean, if you could do that, that would earn, I guess, some respect in our eyes, but whatever. So the players find out that there are several different outposts that Falcon may be held at, and one of which is in the Underdark. And they're like, well, I mean, we're looking for an item that's in the Underdark. What if we just went to the Underdark and tried to accomplish, you know, two birds with one stone situation, and, and maybe we'll rescue Falcon, maybe we'll get the shield back, we'll at least go after both and see if we can get it. Uh, which was indeed my idea. I wanted them to go after Falcon, I wanted them to try to kill two birds with one stone, and uh, they decided to. So it worked. So they travel to the Underdark, they get in some encounters, some battles, solve some uh, difficult situations, uh, things like that, and they're taking a long rest, and this is where we pick up this week's session. They're taking a long rest at the very end of the long rest, so I made sure they were already rested up. Um, they, uh, someone shouts out to the person who's on guard and says, surrender, you're now slaves, and darkness erupts through the cavern. They can't see anything. Their light spells don't work. It's complete and utter darkness. However, Azarin manages to use one of her channel divinities to get rid of all of the magical darkness, uh, instantaneously dispelling the effect. Uh, was very cool, and they came across there were some drow slavers who were trying to uh, take them as slaves, as drow sometimes are wont to do. And uh, they fight off this ambush. There was a drider in the mix there, and so at first the drow were no big deal, and then the drider turned out to be big deal. Uh, the players, it was an interesting combat encounter. I mostly just want to keep throwing Underdark encounters at the players at this point because I want them to understand how terrifying and alien the Underdark is. I don't want to just be like, oh yeah, overland travel, no big deal, like the surface world. Because for 7th level players, I feel like traveling through a mundane forest 
not that big a deal. Uh, I may narrate, there were some wolves that showed up, but you, you know, know how to scare them off. You killed one and then got rid of them, that kind of a thing. There was an owl bear or whatever, you spooked it. No big deal. Not you know, exciting, crazy things, but in the Underdark, mundane travel through the regular place is terrifying and scary because everything down here is trying to murder you. So uh, I wanted to really emphasize that, that's why I threw this encounter at them. Also, I wanted to throw this encounter at them because the drow had slaves already with them. There were a few Svrfneblin, which are super cool little guys, deep gnomes, and um, I was trying to give the players a guide. The players have no idea where they're going in the Underdark. They needed a guide, and I knew I was going to give them one, somebody who could uh, navigate them through the Underdark, and this saving uh, some potential slaves and setting them free is owing a life debt, so ta-da, here's somebody who's willing to be a guard. And by guard, I mean guide. Whoops. So anyways, I was trying to figure out how does this player, how do these players interact with this NPC? How do they talk to them? They're, they speak undercommon, and the players surely speak undercommon, right? So I went through this whole thing of like, there probably would be one of the four or five Sverf Nibelin who uh, speaks really broken common, and I went through all these, had all these ideas about like, okay, maybe, maybe they, uh, I, I'm thinking about my own experience with speaking Spanish. I speak Spanish moderately, and I did so better a number of years ago when I was using it more often, and, but I, but I really, I generally didn't conjugate. I could, I could do really well in the present tense, but conjugating past participial and future progressive and everything was just too much. And so uh, I was never really good at that at that aspect. So I could communicate really well with somebody if they were willing to put up with me being in present tense all the time. So I was like, hey, that'd be cool. Maybe uh, these Sverfniblin only speak such such weak and broken common that it is just present tense. And they have the players have to start to understand and communicate with present tense. And maybe other, like, uh, they don't use slang or contractions. Okay. And I had all these cool ideas about how uh, they were going to follow these speech patterns and the like, and uh, we start that encounter, and I start mentioning something in Undercommon, and you know, the language that they clearly don't speak, and uh, Wilhelm raises his hand, is like, uh, I, I speak Undercommon, is that what they're speaking? I was like, oh, well, shoot, yeah, okay, well, throw all of my ideas out, I guess I'll use them later for something else. Uh, yeah, they speak undercommon, you can speak with them just fine, act as a translator. So, that was a fun little thing I came up with and didn't get to use. I'm sure the players will come across someone who b speaks broken common and none of them speak the, that individual's language. But, um, you know, it'll be fun in the future. <laughs> so basically, they describe to this Sverf Nibelin where they're going and what they're after, and he's like, you know what? You set some of my people free. I owe you a life debt. I'll go with you wherever you want me to go. Uh, I'll guide you to Zrazdran, the place you are trying to get to, this drow city. Um, and they pursue uh, following this guide. And uh, it's a, it goes relatively well. I described for them the process of the guide navigating this labyrinth of tunnels that they would have surely gotten lost in, as well as pointing out signs of danger and uh, being able to avoid ambushes and attacks and deadly creatures or eating deadly things. Uh, having I wanted to make sure that, that they knew having this guide with them was the difference between being lost down here and dying and making it to their destination relatively unscathed. And I believe that I accomplished that goal. So they finally get to um, the large, enormous cavern. I describe uh, that the cavern is roughly the size of this entire basement we're playing in, and your characters are the size of your minis. And so it's it's massive, massive cavern. And uh, the city takes up one portion of it, and so the players are looking around. There's all kinds of outposts and compounds and homesteads throughout the rest of the cavern, and, and the players know that one of those is the Titan Guard outpost that they are trying to find where they hope Falcon is being kept. And so uh, Azarin uses her fourth level slot on uh, divination and asks, you know, where is your shield? My, my deity, being held. Uh, if we think it's somewhere in the Underdark, uh, where is it being held? And uh, sort of cryptically, uh, Adara confirms that uh, those whom you most fear have my shield, have my shield. And they're like, great, great, that's even better. I bet the Titan Guard have her shield. Now we have to fight these people who have this powerful artifact that we're after, that's even worse. 
So then they go into the drow city of Saraz Duran, and they barely set foot in there. Uh, it's, it's really hostile, classist, racist, slaving uh, drow society. Uh, I know those are very stereotypical uh, drow things, and it's fun to buck the stereotypes and do something different and uh, that sort of thing, but these are also the first time any of these players have interacted with drow civilization at all, and so at least the first few times that players interact with something, I like to play up the stereotypes. I like to, you know, really go over the top with the specific stereotypes. You got dwarves who are gruff, alcoholic miners, and then after they see that a few times, then you can flip the script and show them something a little different. And um, so I wanted to establish some of the tropes from the get-go, and uh, they had a lot of fun interacting with this really tense situation. They weren't slaves themselves, but they basically got told, if you do anything questionable, you're probably going to get arrested because you're outsiders, and you'll probably get put in slaves, uh, put in slavery as outsiders going to jail because that's the kind of thing that they're going to do. They're going to get you on trumped up charges. It's going to be a bummer if you, uh, if you break any kind of laws or get adjacent to breaking any laws. But anyways, they asked around a little bit, they got some informa information, they found out where the Titan Guard outpost was, and they made their way there, they started to formulate a plan, there was a watchtower, and like, how do we get around this thing, what are we going to do, they spend a little while, maybe a half an hour, coming up with a plan, they're all going to go to the wall of the cavern, because the outpost, the compound is set against the wall, they're going to follow the wall up along, and then they're going to climb up over the uh, sort of guard wall around the compound, and try to pick off as many as possible possible before raising the alarm and going from there. And the first thing they're going to do once they get over the wall is Wilhelm is going to cast uh, Summon Lesser Aberrations in the middle of the compound for some things to fight. Now, you're probably saying, that's not a spell in 5th edition. It's absolutely not, but this player is a Great Old One Warlock, very uh, Cthulhu Lovecraftian kind of vibe, and they asked me early on, they said, hey, can I take Summon Lesser Demons, but or devils or whatever it is, but can I make it aberrations instead? Because that would be pretty neat for my character. And so I just looked at some of the uh, aberrations from that CR, and I remembered I get to pick what aberrations are spawn, and I was like, oh yeah, sure, no big deal, uh, because I could make them roughly equivalent, and uh, it'd be pretty easy, it'd be really cool and thematic. So that was a, a really easy instance of a player reflavoring a spell like that. I probably wouldn't let a player like that reflavor polymorph beasts into polymorph aberrations kind of a thing, uh, but for this sort of a thing where I knew I got to pick what the creature was and that they could be roughly equivalent, I said, no big deal, if it's a balance issue, I'll fix it later. So, the players have their plan in place and they begin their assault on this compound and what followed was one of the most tense and dramatic fights I have ever DM'd for and I've DM'd an Orcus fight. Multiple players went unconscious multiple times and were brought back, and so were enemy NPCs. It was really dramatic, very interesting. I had basically a party of PCs against my player characters, and it was really cool watching it unfold. So let's talk a little bit about the design of this party that I made. This is why some of you have jumped all the way to this point in the video to check this thing out. How did how do you make a party of player characters? Sometimes you want to do that. You want to have a rival adventuring guild or adventurers and uh, a rival party and use player character abilities and class abilities. How do you do that effectively? Because having, you know, two or three pages of a character sheet is insane. How can a DM run like six PCs at the same time to challenge his player characters or her player characters. That's ridiculous. That's uh, that's really difficult. And so how did I go about doing that? I used a method that Matt Colville actually just released a video on. If I can figure out how to get a picture of it, I may not. I may be too lazy, but uh, I'll link it down below for sure. He just released a video this week on action-oriented monsters, and uh, he made uh, a party to challenge his own characters in the, his stream uh, in this fashion, and I saw it a while back, and I've been tinker tinkering with it and using it to some degree. I haven't been using uh, his specific version, but now that he's got a video out on it, I probably will, because it's really cool cool and interesting, but basically the idea is stripping it down so there's, there's st still simplified monster type stat blocks, but you give them more things to do, because if you just make a monster more threatening, more dangerous, more tough, 
boost up the numbers, then if it survives an entire round of focus fire by the players, then it's so nasty that it will probably one-shot the players. And it's bad design, it's not fun to run encounters that way. So basically what I did was I gave the enemy party, the Titan Guard Guild, I gave them AC and hit points equivalent to 6th or 7th level player characters, which is what the players are. I made 5 of them, uh, the players have 6, and the other thing that I did was I created 2 like ninth level uh, characters and I put them down below in the compound. They were going to be the ones interrogating Falcon. And at, at any point I decided the battle's too easy, I can have these people pop out and make the battle significantly harder as reinforcements show up in the middle of battle. That is a great way to balance combats on the fly is to be able to have reinforcements come out and change the nature of the battle. Everybody's, you know, used spell slots and is kind of beat up and now two fresh combatants come in and change the situation. That would make that would have made things a lot harder if I felt like it was too easy. But because we had a player cancel at the last minute, this battle ended up being not at all too easy and I didn't have to use uh, those in reserve. So I'm going to link below the sort of really, really simplified stats that I was using for uh, these enemy characters and sort of the magic items that I had. They had special abilities that they had, that sort of thing. But the gist of the idea is to give these enemies bonus actions specifically. Not a lot of monsters use bonus actions. I think they're really effective for getting off extra abilities. Bonus actions, some reactions, uh, interesting spells. This was the first time my players had fought uh, spellcasters, I think at all, but definitely competent and effective spellcasters, and it was devastating. Sometime I'm gonna have to rant about how overpowered Fireball is for its level. It should either be 66 or 5th level, but let's not get into that right now. So as you can sort of see from this, uh, this enemy party sheet, they had a lot of cool and interesting abilities. Their magic items gave them flavor and extra abilities. Uh, they also had specific and interesting spells. I didn't give them their whole spell list because I knew they didn't need them. And so they're only going to last a few rounds. So might as well give them the spells that'll be effective. And so uh, players were going up and down. It was a really crazy battle. But basically I just took interesting bonus actions and slapped them onto these and then very thematic um, class abilities, like a stunning strike from a monk, and just slapped it on there and said, this guy is, you know, this rogue is of a, a level that he can probably do sneak attack for about this much damage, because I want him to do about this much damage. Do I care what level he is? Absolutely not, because level and class and character sheet are just an imperfect representation of who a character is, so I just made up and put on the abilities that they can do. Are there rogues that can teleport from uh, different shadows uh, in the player's handbook or Xanathar's? I don't think so. I think you have to take a couple levels of Shadow Monk or something to do that. Uh, do I care? Absolutely not. I just slapped on the abilities that I thought were cool and thematic and interesting. Bad guys do not have to follow the rules in the player's handbook. Specifically not the limitations on class abilities and class spell lists and spells. Uh, it's called the Player's Handbook, not the Dungeon Master's Handbook. Feel free to change things up however you need to to make things interesting and dramatic and challenging for your players. Your job as a Dungeon Master is not to follow the rules. Your job as a Dungeon Master is to make things interesting, challenging, and dramatic for your players. As long as everyone's having fun, you are succeeding. So the other thing you may see on here are uh, different things being able to be summoned. Uh, one of the things I told the players beforehand, I made sure to let the players know in our Facebook chat, hey guys, this is gonna be a rough battle. These guys are no joke. Uh, they're tough and they're in the Underdark, so they're even tougher. Like, these are serious combatants. Make sure you have everything ready at your disposal and you have a plan and everything because if you just walk in there, you may all die or most of you die and some of you run away. It's going to be a rough battle. I even joked about having backup characters ready. And I like to hype this up. I like to have um, players sort of really anticipating how crazy a battle is going to be. I knew, as I was saying all that, the far most likely thing was that multiple players were going to go down, maybe one would die, and they would have to resurrect them, but the players would ultimately be victorious. I figured that that was the most likely outcome, and I was basically right. But the reason I wanted to uh, impose how 
terrifying this could be was because I wanted to remind the players of something called concordance, which is something that I've stolen from Matt Colville, I've modified a little bit and I use myself. And basically it's the ability for anyone who wants to, to call on their patron, their deity, uh, whoever, and say, hey, I'm in a pickle, can you help me out? Can you send someone or give me some ability or power or heal me or do something? Because I am, I'm trying to uh, survive and I may not without your help. And the more loyal a follower you are, the more likely your deity is to show up and help you. And gods don't like to be bothered. So if you continually ask them for help, they're going to start saying no and they're going to start cursing you because you should be able to solve your own problems. Only call me in emergencies and emergencies shouldn't be happening every other week. But I wanted to remind the players, hey, you have this ability because I was giving it to some enemies. I was going to have some enemies use this ability and uh, it, it was going to make the battle even harder. And it definitely was. The players climbed up over the wall of the compound and uh, an alarm spell triggered. They were planning on sneaking in, but of course, alarm is there. And as soon as alarm went off, it was awesome because the players did not say, oh man, that's so cheap. He just put that there so that our plan wouldn't work, which is true. But that's not the point. The point is that immediately they said, we should have cast Dispel Magic on Alarm. Alarm's a first level spell, guys. We know that. We should have just cast Dispel Magic on Alarm because oh, I mean, it's probably up here. Why wouldn't it be up here? Of course it's up there. It makes total sense. The players knew it was reasonable and they knew they had made a mistake. Uh, it wasn't me being mean to them or anything like that. It was me going, man, this compound probably has some reasonable alarms and security defenses. Um, you know, like the first level spell, Alarm. They probably have that, right? Well, they do. And so, uh, as soon as they climb over the wall, the enemy team knows they're there, and a really cool knockdown drag out fight happens from there. Fireballs are thrown, the players are in trouble, wall of fire encompasses the players as they're all clumped up together. Um, Azarin dispels the wall of fire, there's fireballs flying everywhere. Have I mentioned how OP fireball is? Anyways, uh, and the players realize we're screwed, we're toast, we're going to lose unless we throw a Hail Mary and call out to our gods. Our plan has gone totally sideways on us, so both of the clerics, uh, Horus and Azarin, take their action on their next turn and call out to their deities, and uh, their deities showed up, and I made sure there were five of my six players are religious in some way, and so I had five servitors ready to show up and help them out and little scenes planned for what happened with interactions with their gods and things like that depending on how loyal uh, they had been and maybe their god rejected their cry i had that sort of thing ready as well and so it was just, it was a really really interesting cool battle and part of it was because i had so many abilities ready for these bad guys i didn't really fudge any of their health numbers i didn't make any numbers that were unreasonable in terms of uh, save DCs or attack rolls or anything like that. All of that would be pretty legal for characters of this level. I just gave them more interesting abilities than just using stat blocks from the monster manual uh, because I wanted to give the players a challenge having to fight creatures of all of these different actions. So everything super tense, sort of last minute. Uh, Horus managed to save the day in huge ways. Uh, everyone really, they, they talked for a while afterwards. Everyone was the MVP of that battle. They were like, oh man, that thing you did was so cool. Yeah, but you saved my bacon over here. And it was just really cool uh, after re action report on that fight. Uh, the two seventh level characters come out of the compound because uh, the wizard had walked over at the very beginning of the compound and sort of banged on the doors and then kept going with the fight. And the player's like, uh oh. There's probably more people inside. And these two higher level characters, like the ninth level characters or whatever, come out of the compound. They realize what's going on. Uh, the sorcerer hands a scroll to a paladin, and the sorcerer casts fireball. The paladin reads the scroll of teleport, and the two of them get out of there. So they may have to face those characters later on, or news of their antics may have reached the Titan Guard home base. And that's pretty much where we ended it. We had them loot everything and gather up a bunch of items. They got a ton of gold. I knew that this was going to be a crazy hard fight, but if they survived and won, they would get rewarded heavily. And they did. I stopped it here because the player who is missing, Charlie, playing Varys, uh, is someone who is going to have some uh, narrative interactions coming up. And so... 
Uh, he he was sort of critical to what I had planned with rescuing Falcon, so I didn't want to proceed from there. Also, it had already been a pretty long session, about five hours, I think. Uh, a couple of combats, really cool battles, things like that. So I st stopped uh, the session from there, and we're going to pick up next week with them rescuing Falcon and getting out of the Underdark and finding out how to do that. So hopefully really interesting going forward. Uh, kind of a long video, but it was a uh, kind of a long session. Uh, really fun getting to go through all that with my players. Really challenging combat. Uh, hopefully you folks learned something interesting about how to make an enemy party. I know I often want to have some character who's like, oh, this guy's like a barbarian of roughly the player's level, but I don't want to make a barbarian character. So how do you take a whole stat block and truncate it down to something more useful? Hopefully this uh, is an example of that. You can use some of my ideas here or go, wow, those are terrible ideas. I would never do it the way that Nick just did it. That's fine, do it a different way, but this is the way that I did it, and I can tell you from a sample size of one, which is super scientific, it was really effective. So uh, hopefully you learned something interesting or <clears throat> maybe learned something not to do, but either way, I appreciate your engagement. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.